All right. Now, watch this transition. Whitley Strieber is the author of Communion. It's all about uh, communion. I'm sure you've read it. So many of you had to have read it. It's about his close encounter of the third kind. And among the best-selling books in history, he's co-author with me of Superstorm that then became the movie The Day After Tomorrow. He is the author of more than 20 other books, including the spiritual classic The Key and the largest selling book on the Roswell incident, Majestic. Most recently, he has published Alien Hunter in the first uh, of his series of novels about alien and human police working together to catch alien criminals on Earth. His current nonfiction is Solving the Communion Enigma, which describes new breakthroughs that could solve the close encounter mystery once and for all. His website is unknowncountry.com. Providing daily news of the edge, it is also the home of the radio program called Dreamland, founded by Art and Ramona Bell and continued by Whitley to this very day. So here, ladies and gentlemen, is Whitley Strieber. Hey, buddy. Hey, Art. Welcome to Satellite Radio. Yes, sir. It's so such an extraordinary pleasure to be talking to you again. I think I was among your first guests, <laughs> and here I am again among your first guests uh, in the new program, and I wish you all the best with it for sure. Thank you. It's really cool. We have so much freedom, so much time. When you actually count up the radio show time versus everything else, we were way ahead here. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's good to have you, and uh, it's hard always to know where to start. But well, there's a lot of places to start, um, and maybe the thing to do is to start with a quick retelling. I think uh, we need to, and, and the yeah. reason is uh, Sirius XM uh, has about 27 million subscribers. And a lot of them are new here, never heard you before, Whitley. So, uh, so there you go. Let's retell it. Okay, well, what they're going to hear now is something that's very different from what they have been led to believe is true. But we have been the victims of skillful social engineering and the automatic knee-jerk reaction to reject what I'm about to tell you about is wrong. It is a mistake. I am telling the truth. And all through the show, all night, you will hear somebody telling the truth. No matter how strange it seems, just remember, you've been tricked. This is the truth. What you believed before you heard this, if you did not know that this was really happening, was a skillfully designed lie created to mislead you. Now, here's what happened to me. And when it happened, I was just exactly where most people are to this day, I would have scoffed at anybody who talked about close encounters of the third kind as anything except fiction. Actually, Whitley, you know what? I don't know what you were doing back then. When, when all this began to happen to you, what, was your, uh, what, what were you doing? What worked? I had just finished uh, publishing a book called War Day. Uh, with my buddy Jim Kanetka, we'd written it together. I loved War Day. Oh, thank you. And it was the big bestseller. It was a very politically intense book during the height of the Cold War, essentially warning about the danger of limited nuclear war at a time when elements of the U.S. government were actually beating the drum for a limited nuclear war because they thought that we would survive and the Russians would be destroyed. And the point of the book was to remind people that limited nuclear war or any kind of nuclear war is a really serious business. Well, it and did that. It did that, and it made a lot of people extremely angry. I received a Ted Kennedy had backed the book on the floor of the Senate and read parts of it and had been a real partisan of the book. And about six 
months before the communion experience, I received a telephone call from one of his aides warning me that uh, someone in the government, I think he said it was Brent Scowcroft, I don't remember, it could have been any number of people, was gunning for me, meaning in, I thought, uh, one of those political tax audits, which I had would receive uh, uh, shortly thereafter, but in any case, uh, where where basically the IRS is told by the politicians, screw around with this individual for a while. And, uh, you know, that's all the presidents say, oh, we would never do that. They all do it. I'm not, I'm not a political partisan here at all. I'm not saying the Democrats don't do it. They do it. I'm not saying the Republicans don't do it. They do it. And in any case. So... That's what I was doing. I was heavily involved in that kind of thing. I hadn't thought about UFOs since I was a kid. Where I had eaten and breathed and lived and breathed that stuff for a while during the mid-50s, one of the boys up the street's father was involved in what was then a famous UFO incident in Texas. He saw a UFO in a field. His car stopped, and the whole nine yards happened to him. And we were just terribly excited about all this, of course. And... uh, uh, this UFO was seen all over South Texas at the, at the, on that night, and it was a famous case. And so I had known about it. But by the time I was in high school, girls and school and getting a car and getting work and learning to drive, and all of that stuff had completely replaced the fantasies of boyhood. Let me put it that way. And at the time, I was a in early middle aged, raising my own child, uh, working as a writer, very, very involved in politics and writing and all kinds of stuff. At the time, this was not in my universe at all, whatsoever. Okay. All right. Okay. So it began when and how? Well, in the middle of the night of December the 26th, 1985. Let me go back to that time. It was a lovely night in upstate New York, about 90 miles north of New York City, not too far from Woodstock. Beautiful, wooded, hilly area. Beautiful evening. The sun set early, of course, dead of winter. The snow was falling softly. It was just, we took a little walk out on the road. The breeze was cold winter breeze was whistling in the pines. It was just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Then we went to bed. At some point during the night, I became aware of noises. It was, in fact, quite noisy. And I was confused because, you know, here I am in a cabin in the woods in the middle of the Middle of nowhere. There's 15 miles of just straight woods outside my okay. side door. No, noisy in what way? I mean, oh, I, like I, people talking and clangs and and okay. grunting and thuds and all kinds of things. It was just oh. noisy. Okay. And so I opened my eyes, and I did not know where I was. I did not understand this. I saw what I first thought was some kind of a tent. Then a moment later, I had a memory of sitting in the woods in the snow with these strange people and going up in an elevator where there was no elevator, something I remembered in a little bit more uh, context when I was later hypnotized by a psychiatrist about this, which I'll get to in a little while. Anyway, here I am in this situation, and I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to, like, make the bed reappear around me because that's where I'm supposed to be, and I'm assuming it's a nightmare. A dream or something. It's sure. not real. It can't be. Then I see this thing. It is. It, it shoots past it, it, toward my feet, a dark blue thing. A few moments later, I see what looks like a gigantic insect darting its face at me. And um, did I get scared? Well, no, I was completely calm. I was no problem whatsoever. I'm lying. I got terrified. <laughs> yeah, I would be too. Unbelievable. The terror was, I, 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 the book communion, my wife Anne and I, we thought we would call it body terror first because it was about a kind of fear 
that I, we had never known, I had never n- known was possible before. It was unbelievably intense. Was so, it paralyzed? Would you say it was paralyzing or? It would have, it would know. I would have been going like beat 60 if I'd been able to move, but I could not do that. Well, that sounds I, paralyzing. I ab- absolutely could not do that. And, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, I, yeah, I'm sorry, Art. I don't know how that happened. I must apologize. Somebody dialed the number. It's... Well, somebody dialed another number in here. <laughs> I, I had thought I had turned that line off. I'm very sorry. Anyway, right. uh, here I am in this situation. Uh, the, the uh, You said it looked like an insect. It looked like a big insect. It looked like I saw eyes, like a big bug eyes, big shiny bug eyes. I didn't see anything else initially. Now what begins to happen is a couple of things. First, I begin to hear this voice saying, what can we do to help you stop screaming? This voice (laughs) is mechanical and very gentle, female sounding, but it's obviously a machine, some kind of a recording that somebody's made. And it's not reassuring because it doesn't sound human. It doesn't quite sound like a machine either. It's just damned weird, damned weird. And uh, uh, I uh, it was so confused and frightened by it, and I could not move. Next thing I see did is, this thing appear and disappear, Willie, or was uh, could you did you have eyes on it the whole time, or what? Uh, uh, no, oh, I darted around. They all were moving so fast I couldn't see them. I mean, I could see them, but only for seconds. And I didn't have much of a field of vision. I couldn't move my head. I couldn't move anything. And I heard this voice off to the side saying this. Then this blue creature that looked like a gigantic, it was almost frog-like. It was strange with a blue uniform, a lot of flaps on it, like a jumpsuit of some kind, kind of like a working suit, comes up and starts to open a box that has a needle in it. And by this time, I'm starting to shriek, and I get to, I yell out something along the lines of, you're going to ruin a beautiful mind. You're going to ruin my mind because it's getting ready to stick this thing in the side of my head, which it does do. Ruin your night. It's going to ruin mind, your night. Mind. I said mind. Oh, mind. Okay. Mind. Oh, no. My night is <laughs> ruined. It was ruined already. That yeah, night I was ruined. I was going to say, hold on, wait a minute. We do have a break here. We've got lots of time on satellite radio, but occasional breaks. Oof. Insect eyes. I don't like the sound of that. Big insect eyes. And blue? Hmm. Not a good color. I'm Art Bell, and this is Dark Matter with Whitley Streeper. The music kind of sets it for me. I don't know about you, but it sure does me. It sets the mood. And I'm in the mood, all right? So we've got this insect-like creature, bluish, above Whitley, who's in bed, terrified, with a needle headed toward his head, I guess. And that's kind of where we left it. Uh, Whitley, I don't know how you tell this story without... Without breaking down, uh, honestly, I don't. But don't. Well, I've told the story a lot of times, or yep. I mean, quite a lot of times. I've gone far beyond the story. I mean, there's much, much more. This is this the, the core story that we're retelling here for the listeners who have never heard it before, which you apparently have some of. So, sure. Let us continue. Here we are. Here I am. I am in this. What I thought at this point was a tent. And because uh, it had sort of gray walls, it was kind of circular and quite small. How did you get there? I mean, suddenly you I have no idea. I, well, I do have a vague, I had a vague memory the next morning of being carried by somebody, by people. Uh, it had not yet occurred to me that anything, I mean, the, the next morning, but let me go, before we go into that, let me go back to where we were, because the next thing that happened was extraordinary and terrible. I have subsequently learned a lot about what it was that happened. But what I initially felt was that I was 
something was pushed into me anally, which has become a famous joke, uh, the f- joke about the rectal probe that the, the uh, uh, South Park, I believe, not, either South, I, one of those. So that's where it came from. That's where it came from. Yeah, exactly. However, I would like to mention to the listeners, just in passing, those who are snickering happily at this story, that it took me more than 20 years to even tell my wife what the doctor had told me about a five or six days afterwards when I had gone to him. He told me, you have, Whitley, he said, you have been raped. Those were his words. And I was not able to say that. As a result of which, I became a national laughing stock for having. I completely raped. understand, Willie. I completely understand. Really, I do. And I, I've seen all the jokes about it. I've seen what Cartman said, <laughs> all the rest of it. But you know what? Um, that's what it is: is rape. And there's nothing yeah. funny about that. You didn't. You didn't react to it as something funny when we first talked about this on the radio, which was a very refreshing, because I had gone on television show and radio program, television show and radio program again and again and again for two or three years. And every time I went on, I was laughed at for being raped. And I was not in a good state psychologically by that time. Uh, I wanted to do the same to some of the morons who had done this to me, who had been laughing at me. Uh, and uh, I, as I recall, the gentleman who right South Park actually did an interview in which they bragged about having used me as a role model, but not in such a way that I could sue them. They had been given legal advice. Sure. Uh, and I thought that was just extraordinarily cruel. Well, but, plus you're a, you're a public person. I, you know. Yeah, well, exactly. You, 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 once you're a public person in the U.S., forget it as far as that kind of thing is concerned. Your bar gonna, changes. You're, yeah. yeah, you're going to get you, you, and you're, you, the sky is the limit, and anything goes. So, well, actually, actually, not quite everything, as I was able to prove. But well, that's uh, right. Pretty you're much an, anything an, goes. You're <laughs> you're an exception, and then, but not not exactly because you see. In your case, it was a—it's a different story. I mean, it, 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 there are some people involved in it who weren't public people, and so on and so forth. But anyway, here's the next thing I remembered clearly was the next morning. And there's a lot of took more of this. The next morning, I wake up, and I thought of there was something had gone on, and I said to my wife, uh, "Did you notice anything unusual during the night?" She said, "No, it was quiet." And so I figured, oh. Maybe it was a nightmare, but I had a feeling or sort of sense of there being having been some kind of ruckus. And uh, I was very uneasy during the day. I didn't. It was not in pain yet. I would that would happen. Um, I, um, I was working on something, a story or something, and that would later become important. But in any case. So the next day, your memories were foggy of what happened. They were foggy. I mean, I, something had gone wrong. I was very clear on that. But I couldn't figure out what it could have been because, you know, Ann had been sleeping right beside me, and there was absolutely sure. nothing wrong. And uh, there was nothing wrong in the house. My child was fine. No one had broken in. And toward the evening, I became frightened. I became terribly frightened. And I'd been basically frightened all fall. I had, in October, I had spent bought a, an alarm system from Radio Shack and installed it. Uh, I was become I had become obsessed. I had bought guns. I was marching around the house at night with sh- a shotgun in my hand. I'm in the middle of the woods where you know, no crime had been committed since the Indians had been there. No, I'd, I'd have yeah. a gun, too. I'd yeah, have well, a gun, too. Do you have, I mean, a memory, do you have a memory of when that needle went into your head? Oh, yeah. yeah. I have vivid memories of all of it. But the, 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 the first thing that happened was the next, not that day, but the day after. First that night, as the night fell, I got very frightened. And I decided that an owl had come into the house. And Anne's sitting right beside me right now. She probably remembers this very well. She's nodding. I said, I think maybe an owl got in during the night. And she said, how can an owl get in? And I realized that was true. I mean, we didn't even have a chimney. We had a wood stove. But, you know, an owl's not going to come down the chimney of a wood stove that's lit. And their windows were all shut, so no owl. Night came, and it was terrible. 
I, I could not sleep. Finally, I got to sleep. And the next day, I'm sitting there working, and I begin to hurt. My uh, rectum starts to hurt. My head starts to hurt. And they're hurting a lot. And I'm aware of the fact at this point I have been in some way assaulted. I just can't remember it clearly. So I go to the doctor a couple days later. And he goes through this, he examines me, he says, well, this little thing on your head is probably a spider bite, so it looks like to me. And uh, then he says, he looks at me and he examines me and he says, well, you know, you do know that you've been raped. And I thought, holy God, how can this be? And then I immediately, uh, that e- evening, riding, driving back up to the country house from the doctor's office in New York, I began to remember that I had been in the woods with a group of people. And I remembered one of them in particular was an old friend. And I don't know if I put this in community or not. It's in the new book, Solving the Community and Enigma, because I got it figured out later. And I was, and I remembered him in the woods. So when I got home, I went and looked around in the woods trying to figure out. It was very snowy. I figured out some indication of where I had been or seen him or what. No, 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 no success. And I began to think, you know, well, he was, he joined, we were college friends. He joined the Central Intelligence Agency. I had heard from him off and on in the, over the years, but not much. And I thought to myself, my God, wait a minute. The Kennedy guy says to me, I'm, they're gunning for me. Now this happens. Did somebody come in here and drug me? Is that what happened? And if so, this son of a bitch knows about it. So this was the, at this point, I'm also, I start trying to get a hold of him. I had his phone number in, in, in his home and uh, can't get it disconnected. And I forgot it figures, you know, a bastard. And I'm running after him. I'm, it's a crime. And uh, at this point, I'd also, going down another path, uh, my brother had given me a, uh, a, uh, uh, a book about UFOs for Christmas, and uh, I was uh, uh, reading this book, and that got me to talking to Bud Hopkins, who was a huge UFO investigator at the time, and he introduced me. He wanted to hypnotize me, and I said, oh, no, forget it. If anyone hypnotizes me, it has to be a true profession. So to his credit, he found Dr. Donald Klein, who was the uh, head of the uh, New York State Department of Psychiatry at the time and had been a forensic hypnotist for years at that point in his career. He'd solved over 70 cases using memory-based hypnosis. After communion came out, there were hundreds of media stories about how hypnosis is this and hypnosis is that, all crap. It works perfectly well forensically. It's worked forensically for years, and uh, uh, it, it is a perfectly adequate means of recovering lost memories. Okay, that said, one of the best professionals in the world would hypnotize me shortly thereafter. But anyway, getting back to this business with a friend. Yeah, so far I I fully understand your reaction. Yeah. Um, You know, after that report with the doctor and recognizing this guy, you go after him hard as you can. So I figure I'm sort of a meet the doctor. We're kind of laughing up our sleeves at Bud, who very sincerely believes I've been abducted by aliens. And I have to tell you, I was thinking that, you know, this guy is a fool, but the doctor is really good. So I got into hypnosis with the doctor. And I remembered things that I regarded as utterly impossible. They were essentially the same things that had been in my mind that had been troubling me because it was like a psychotic break, okay? I mean, it was, it was just bizarre. And uh, uh, I'm having this. You were you were recorded during hypnosis. Oh yeah, the recordings are available on my website. Okay. The recordings uh, of the right. hypnosis two, two hypnosis sessions are available on my website, and uh, uh, the on unknowncountry.com. I think you have to be a subscriber to listen to them, but that's another story. It's amazing case, to me that you you would put them up there. Really I amazing. put them up. Well, I put them up there because this is the truth. This is all the truth. Whether it's about aliens or not, we'll get to that. But it's the truth. 
Now, back to the doctor's office. I have this bizarre couple of hypnosis sessions, and I leave this thinking. He thought that I had been the victim of a crime and that these bug insect faces would turn out to be people that we could perhaps identify. So I'm left with the bugs and no idea of what's going on. It seems completely crazy to me. And so I now zero in on the CIA guy. I figure he's got to be responsible. They shot me up with LSD or whatever. I, I don't take drugs. I know nothing very little well, about He's the only one you recognize, so where else to go? Sure. So here is what happened finally. I finally tracked him down and found out he'd been dead since the previous March, when I saw him in my woods. Oh, brother. And I thought to myself, oh, boy, you are going insane. You have lost it. And no, that's no, 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 I, I want to be clear. I'm sorry, Whitley. You're saying he had been dead since the incident? No, no, since long words, before the incident. Long before? Oh, months, yes. see, nine months before, the previous March, March okay. of 85, and here it is now. Early 86, nearly a year later, the guy was dead when I saw him. He'd been long dead. Okay. So, okay, now table that for a minute. I'm, I then start with MRI scans, with tests for temporal lobe epilepsy, with every kind of test you can imagine. I even took lie detector tests to see if I was lying to myself. And in the end, I was left face-to-face -face with the unknown, I had to face the fact that I did not know what happened to me, and that damned crazy as it seemed, Bud Hopkins' explanation was the, best, was the best one out there. How did you do with the lie detector tests? Fine. I took a number of them. I took two of them from uh, the guy who did lie detector tests for the New York City Police Department. Right. And uh, then I took another for the BBC in London because they wouldn't let me go on the BBC before taking, unless I took a lie detector test and signed a document stating <clears throat> that no matter the outcome, I would go on the air with it. And I passed that one too. I passed all of the tests. I, my MRIs were normal. I did not have temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, although a few years later, uh, the apparently, I, then I said I've been led to believe it might have been the U.S. US Air Force and some of their little social engineering projects that they should not be engaging in, but probably do, um, it placed a fake story in Parade Magazine saying that I had admitted I had temporal lobe epilepsy and made a big contribution to the Epilepsy Foundation. They did that right before I put out my book, Confirmation, which was critical of the Air Force uh, for keeping secrets it should not keep, in my opinion. And um, so that was out there. In any case, I didn't have any diseases. I was perfectly healthy. I didn't even have high blood pressure. There was one thing that was noticed, and that was I took an extensive bank of psychological tests, and the psychologist said, you are under extreme tension. You are under very high levels of stress, and you should definitely do something about that because this level of stress that you're under, which is showing up in these tests, is not normal even for a person who is in a stressful situation. It's most unusual. And uh, 10 years later, I took the same test. And I was still under the same stress. I guess I'm good at handling stress. In any case, so at this point, I became very compulsive about this thing. I started going out into the woods at night from the house, with my wife terrified of what might happen to me, and neither one of us understanding what was going on, very frightened for our child. And, but I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop going to the country house. I couldn't stop going in the woods. She would not let, go, let me go up alone. And eventually, along about March or April, these little creatures started to come back. And they started, you know, you, you said you became compulsive about yeah, it and, yeah. and went into the woods. I mean, isn't that, I don't know, almost in inviting it? Uh, it was inv oh, absolutely inviting it. That was my intention. Because I figured this, whatever happened was one of the most extraordinary and unusual things that's ever happened to anybody. 
And I'm not going to run away from it, for God's sake. I'm a writer. I'm going to write about it. I'm going to go out in those woods, and I'm going to get this thing figured out. I'm going to nail it down. I'm what, was your, what, what was Anne, your wife, saying to you in this period? I mean, she had to be worried at all kinds of levels about you. So how did she feel? Well, we had initially, I had, when I thought I was going insane, I tried to get her to divorce me, and we had fights. Anne is an incredibly courageous person. Anne is a, she's, she fought for her marriage. She fought for my sanity. And when she realized what was really going on, she fought and has continued to fight to this day on half of this truth. And when we started to get mail after communion came out, back in the letter days when there were still letters, and people weren't just dashing off emails all the time, uh, there were real letters, physical letters. We got them by the bag full, by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, finally by the hundreds of thousands over a period of 20 years. Again and again and again, people telling their stories from all over the world. And Anne is a speed reader. She's very brilliant. She read these letters. She read them all. She created a chart, which she kept on the wall in her office. And that, on that chart, eventually there appeared the phrase, which has gotten me in a lot of trouble with the UFO community. They want this to be aliens and silvered flying saucers from another planet who are coming and sampling our DNA and whatever else they're doing. She said, and I'm quoting her, this has something to do with what we call death. And here's why she said that. I am not the only person to see a dead friend in connection with this experience. That's commonplace. You'll never hear that from the UFO investigators, but it's commonplace. It's ordinary. It is in letter after letter after letter. And when we began to have groups of people up at our cabin and had group experiences, very complex experiences with these visitors, they showed up. They they bought into this, what I, effort I was making. They came. They were there off and on for 11 years, Art. 11 years. Okay, it has something to do with death, Willie. That's yeah. really interesting. And, and okay, uh, have you come to understand what it has to do with death? Well, let me tell you a story, because that's how I live and how I communicate in stories, as you know. Sure, sure. Um, okay. I am... Sit in my office one day. Phone rings. It's my agents, William Morris Agency in New York. They say there is a man desperately trying to get a hold of you, Mr. Streeter. And I thought to myself, he's a, he said he's a member of the public, and I thought, you know, I'm I'm pretty well hidden. If this guy has found my at my literary agency, he's trying real hard, and there must be. He says it's terribly important, and he's desperate. Right. So I call him. He tells me this story. He and his wife. Are in their bedroom, I mean, in their living room, their old dog is asleep at the, on the hearth it's night, 10 o'clock or so at night. Suddenly the dog becomes very agitated, and the dog needs to go out again the second time. Very unusual for this dog. The wife takes the dog out. As she's opening the front door, she sees a fireball race off across the sky and disappear beyond the pine trees around their house. She turns back to her husband and says, I just saw a plane going down in flames. You're going to get a call because he's with the FAA. Right. At that moment, their little seven-year-old boy comes running downstairs saying, Mommy, Daddy, Mommy, Daddy, little blue men. Note this, little blue men, familiar? I had seen them. Oh, yeah. Little blue men, same guys, came into my room, and they had Bobby, his older brother, with them. And he said to tell you he's all right. This is why this desperate father had made this call. The boy, the older boy, the teenager, had died in an auto accident the week before. He wanted to know, and he asked me, can you tell me if anyone else has ever had an experience remotely like this? Do I have any reason to believe this? And I said to him, I have, and many others have. It's ordinary. And This is uh, going to be disturbing to so many people on so many levels. Because on so many levels. Yeah. It means, the, it means this. The soul is 
real, there is an afterlife, and not only that, we aren't alone in it. That all of these cherished beliefs we have about heavens and hells or the, the, the Bill Maher conceit that this is it and we don't have to worry about it anymore when we die, we're dead, we're just pieces of meat, all of that, all of it, both the believers and the non-believers, it's all out the window. Because the truth is, we do have an afterlife, but we don't know a thing about it. We don't have the straight story in any way, in my opinion, judging from what I have seen and heard myself and seen and heard from thousands of other witnesses. Wow. That's the truth of it. That's All right. The truth that's, of it. A, that, that's a big wow. Hold it right there. I'll do the break, and we'll come back. That's a good place to break uh, or a bad place, depending on how you look at it. Wow. There is an afterlife, but not the one we've been taught about. All right, with us tonight is Whitley Streeter, and his story is, uh, you know, on the one hand, I want to say like no other, and, and really it is like no other, except Whitley's telling you, and I'm telling you, that many others have experienced some portion of or what he did. So it's not as uncommon as you think. But it is scary. This is Dark Matter. No, don't call yet. Uh, just make note of the number, and I'll let you know when we're going to go to the uh, lines. My guest is Whitley Strieber, and I've got to tell you, I've sat and I've thought about this in the last few moments, and... If um, what had happened to Whitley happened to me, I'm, I'm not. I I'm not at all sure that I would have come forward. Uh, I, I guess I would have gone to the doctor. I would have chased that guy, uh, who we now learned had had actually died earlier. But maybe that's where I would have stopped. I I don't know that I would have been going into the woods nightly. I don't know that I would have told a soul, save perhaps my wife. I really thought hard about this. I, I don't think that I would have told people this story. That takes a lot of courage. Whitley? Well, you know, Art, I, if looking back now, I definitely would not have done this. If I had known what it would be like, what my life would be like having done it, I never, and what my family would have gone through, never. But at the time, it didn't seem... Like it, that, it seemed like a rather unusual and fascinating story. Uh, my publisher probably knew that it would be a bigger sensation than I did, but he, we both thought it had happened to maybe 50 people in the world. And uh, I had by that time met Bob Hawkins' group of aptees, and, uh, you know, I, we just, he thought it was maybe a couple hundred people. I thought 50, I thought maybe he knew about half of the people, 25 or so, who had happened to it. Because nobody ever talks about it. There was nothing about it at all. I had no idea what would happen. I'm well, what, what you just told me about death, um, uh, the association with death, death really with got death. to me. And, and, yeah. and here's somebody, Tim, uh, is sending me a message who says, if possible, could be a connection with John Lear's assertion the aliens are using the soul catcher technology when humans pass on, and John has said something like that. Oh, Lord. Uh, <laughs> May it not be so. Uh, I have right. no idea whether or not anything called soul catcher technology even exists or such a thing could be real. Well, it's just, it's just a phrase, but, I mean, it, it yeah. obviously has a connection to aliens and to our soul and to death. Well, one thing, a couple things are very clear. Is there is a lot of this connection and a lot of reports from not only from people who had encounters with their dead friends and relatives at my cabin in the context of of, of contact with the Greys, but also in the letters. And there aren't any where there are any people from the other side who are desperate for help or screaming that they've been trapped or anything like that. Of course, if the, there's some that have been trapped, then we're obviously not going to know. We're not going to hear from them because they're trapped. 
Right. But it, let me give you an example. Uh, and this is someone who's been on the air with me, and uh, she's mentioned by, by name in my book, In Solving Communion Enigma. She's borne witness to this. Both of these people whose names I'll mention have many times. It's, these are not people who are, who are shy about this at all. First one is Lori Barnes. Uh, Lori is a – she Anne has – my wife is – she doesn't realize it. She's got a. She's a psychic, but she, she's a, she's a non, a non aware of her psychic powers. Psychic, and she got Laurie. She it was reading the letters, and she said suddenly, "I need a secretary, and this la- lady is going to be the secretary." It turned out she lived in Manhattan, in across the street from us, and she was also an excellent secretary. So she was. She she came into our life and brought her in, and they were worked on the letters together years and uh, she come up to the cabin and one time Ann said I'm going to get a group of people up at the cabin who will come together and the visitors are going to come when they're there and so she got Ann, she got Laurie Barnes she got another lady called Raven Dana who had a lot of contact experiences, a number of other people and this was the second big group we'd had up there so we knew, knew it could work and the first thing that happened in that was in the late afternoon Laurie's out walking on the road by herself And suddenly, she sees a man standing in the road. It's her brother. Now, this is something big in her life because her brother's disappeared from the face of the earth 20 years before, and the FBI had given up on the case. And suddenly, there he is standing in the road, and she says, you're back. He's wearing this sort of brown cowl-like thing, which immediately sort of brings a makes her think this is not a normal experience. And he says, I just wanted to tell you that I'm fine. Whereupon he lifts off and sort of floats back into the woods and disappears. She comes back to the house in what could be described as a a state of agitation and tells the story. We're all fascinated. But it's typical of the story. You notice the boy in the in the house that I the story I told earlier. I'm tell mom and dad I'm all right. I just want you to know I'm all right. Another case at the cabin. This was in another very complex experience with the 17 people in the cabin, including a magazine editor from a big magazine, who has promised that if the visitors show up, he will write about it in his magazine. They do show up. He does see them. Then he says, I can't write about it. It'll ruin my career. I was up against well, that kind it, of it might have. All it of certainly might have. But why did he make the promise to them and to me? Why make a promise you can't keep? Well, would... you know what? When you're <laughs> when when you're making a promise like that, never in a million years do you think it's really going to happen. So you make it easily, and you think you're going to write about well. Yeah, you know, exactly. About, yeah. Well, it's like the old Life magazine. I had a friend, Timothy Greenfield Saunders. Was, who's the first person I ever told this story to. He's a f- famous photographer in New York, and he decided he wanted to do a story for Life magazine about this. And, and we, we traveled all around the country to different places where these people had had experiences. And at the end of it, in Gulf Breeze, Florida, he and Ann and I saw this marvelously beautiful UFO. And so we had this picture and everything for Life magazine. They had expected us to say we went around and we didn't see a single thing. Ho, ho, ho. End of story. Instead, we said we not only saw a UFO, we have a picture of it. They wouldn't run it. They wouldn't run the story. And they said, well, our audience is very religious, and they won't take yeah. kindly to the story now, so we won't run it. And well, I, I, I hate to say I understand, but I, I actually do. I do, too. And I find it very disturbing that we can't, we are collectively kind of turned away from the truth. And once you face the truth, it feels so good and so right. But anyway, let's go back to Laurie and to these other incidents. The uh, next incident happened before Laurie. The visitors show up in the living room uh, while the magazine editor and three other people are lying there on couches and the cots, uh, not asleep, of course. I mean, who's going to sleep on a night like that? Obviously, it's about 2 o'clock in the morning. And suddenly one of them says, I can't move. And they all can't move. 
but they still talk. And there are the blue guys are in there jumping around like the flying Karamazov brothers uh, jumping around in the living room. Meanwhile, down in the basement, there's a couple in a more private context because they're young, recently married young couples, as I recall. And uh, they wake up because the room is filled with light suddenly. And there standing at the foot of the bed is a friend of theirs from Mexico, who they were, one of them was Mexican, and uh, 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 from Mexico who had died in the Mexico City earthquake of 1983, and this was like 1988 or 89. And she says, I'd like you to know that I'm all right. Is she standing there big as life? Well, that'll certainly uh, modify a newlywed moment. Uh, well, they had they had their honeymoon, <laughs> for sure. In any case, uh, this is this is typical of these experiences. The the encounters with the dead come in the context of encounters, especially with the little blue guys. And this is this thing, Art. It's not secret. It's that we don't choose to look. Let me tell you another story. This happened to a psychologist. He is driving on the Grand Central Parkway in New York, in Queens, near uh, uh, LaGuardia Airport. And suddenly he sees a plane coming toward him at an altitude of 300 or 200 feet. A huge jet looks like it's going to land on the highway. It's missed the runway and is somehow or another landing on the highway. And he thinks, holy God, we're all going to be killed. Sure, sure. It goes over at nosebleed altitude. And as it's going over, he realizes this is not a real airplane. This doesn't, the engines aren't real. They're solid. There's something is very wrong here. And he slows down. He starts to pull over because he's in shock. He doesn't, does anybody else see it? Then he sees cars parked on the roadside. He says, yes, people have seen this thing. He right. gets out, and he sees this strange thing on the roadside, up on a little berm above the road, like a billboard with strange symbols passing across it, like uh, one of those lighted signs in Times Square. And there are people walking through the dark under it, and they're kind of beginning to gather and stand in a circle. And he's, well, what the hell? He goes over there, and they are standing there, and he starts to try to join the circle. All of a sudden, he finds himself surrounded by these short, very dark blue figures who strike him as being tough as nails. And, yes, I agree with that. I've had some experiences with them. These guys are not fooling around. Uh, they may fool with the soul, but they're not fooling around. And one of them snarls at him and says, get out of here. He turns around. He goes back to his car, gets in his car. He goes home. That's what I would have done. Yeah. Now, I put that story in Breakthrough, I believe, my one of my books. And I got letters from people, other people who had been on the highway and seen it happen. Now, it happened on a highway in New York. How often does that happen? And nobody says anything. Nobody remembers. We. This is life. This I don't know how. How often does any of what you've been talking about happen? All the time. And and that, and I think so. And then we're not all be told. I. You know, I'd be so hesitant to say anything, Woodley. I. I'd really be hesitant. I mean, yeah. I. I debated with myself. Um, until the cows came home after I saw that big triangle UFO, yeah. I came so close to not telling it because, you know, I was oh, on the air. I was talking about this kind they of stuff. They eat you alive. sounded foolish, yeah. They eat exactly. you alive. There's some part of us deep inside us that wants to keep this thing undercover. We, we believe we have been programmed somehow to keep this secret. And people will hate you. They'll eat you alive. They'll, they'll, they'll do anything, anything to keep this under wraps, especially when it comes close to them, when they hear the tone of truth in someone's voice. They don't want to hear that. It makes them mad. It makes well, really, them full of hate. You, you, with regard to what I saw, um, the only thing that made me feel better, and I, I did, I made the decision to tell it first and went on the air with it and all the rest of it, what made me feel better was that Within a week, a newspaper article came out saying that I wasn't the only one, that people all across the valley had seen the same serious craft. And, oh, they said it was a C-130, which was ridiculous. But, you know, to hear that other people 
saw it made me feel so good. <laughs> yeah, it does feel good. And it made me feel good to get all those letters, too. Sure. Because all of a sudden I was realizing that not only was I not the only one, but I was actually not having the strangest experiences or the scariest. Well, Maybe. what you had will do for me. Well, well listen, you, you want to be... I can take you down any path you want to go in terms of strangeness and weirdness, even in my own life. And solving community, which, by the way, nobody read, um, it's out there. If you can want it, you can get it. It's an ebook. It's uh, You can get it at a bookstore, uh, possibly, if they carry it. Most most bookstores won't even carry my books because it's Whitley Strieber. You know, you don't want to carry his book. He's a liar. Uh, and people hate the truth. They love a lie. You know, you go out on the UFO circuit and you tell lies, you'll get a thousand people in the auditorium listening to your lies. Well, you I tell see the truth where, and you get 53 people. Yeah, I, I see where the UFO community starts to have a problem with what you're saying. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, you know, when you start mixing souls in with this, um, we don't aliens. Know the, soul. the soul is very unfashionable right now. I mean, <laughs> the soul is, we're meat. We don't, we're. We're, we're scientists in the UFO community. We're scientists, too. We don't want to talk about souls. Oh, God. That's a less. They, we, we want to be believed here. Well, uh, well it, if it, you it, tell it, the it, truth, yeah. you forget being believed. It ain't going to happen. It's already, difficult. it's already difficult when you're talking about aliens. That's hard enough. Yeah. When you start combining it with the kind of experience you had, and then dead folks. It really go gets... beyond this. I can well, go farther out and still be telling the truth. Uh, well, go where that. you need to go. Go, go right. where you want. Let's go back to Lori Burns. Then. Tell, her another, tell you another experience she had. This was in 1954. She's now, at this point in her life, she's a young woman. She's pregnant. She's at home alone one night. Her husband is an entertainer. He works at night. And all of a sudden, she hears a noise and looks up, and to her horror, these little dark blue figures are standing in a row, in a, in, a, in a line beside her bed. Horrible creatures, like frog-like. Uh, you know what they remind me of? Remember the movie Ghost? Oh, uh, yes. The, the person who wrote that movie had an unconscious knowledge of these creatures because the creatures that come up in that movie are like these guys. Anyway, that's aside. Let's go back to Laurie. And she's shocked beyond words. I mean, she's pregnant with her baby, and these monsters are suddenly in the room. And she's terrified. One of them, the one at the front, puts his hand on her arm and says, Do not be afraid. We are not here because of you. We're interested in the girl child you're carrying. Which, as Lori said, might didn't be reassure me at all. Right. And uh, she said, and this is the key part, she said, and listen closely, my God, you're so ugly. And he said, one day, my dear, you will look just like us. <laughs> so oh. are you ready, Art, for your next time around? <laughs> I, I, don't know. I don't know. I'm telling you. We, we're we just starting out. We can go way down the road I'll, I'll into another that. level of reality, into All another right. kind of truth. Okay. Jeff asks the following. Could it be possible that these abductees aren't seeing deceased people? Could it be that the abductors are using their memories to calm them somehow during this experience? Is it? on some level to calm them or to deceive them into believing something about this that isn't true. Yes, of course it could be. Of course. I'm not going to defend this in that way. What I'm saying is the truth is something extremely strange is happening. This is real. This is the truth. What it is and what it actually all means in the final analysis that I can't. That question I cannot answer. Well, it yeah. certainly, it is very reasonable, I think, to ask if perhaps these creatures 
are looking into your your brain. Hold on, Brittany. Oh, absolutely. Okay, we've got a break here. And and looking and finding something familiar and then presenting you with that so that you, you don't lose your mind on the spot. You're listening to Dark Matter. I'm Marcel. Around and around. What's it going to be like next time? Some songs are just so right. Whitley, welcome back. Hello, Whitley. Hello, Art. Right. Around and around. What, what's it going to be like next time? <laughs> I wonder, too. You have an incredibly beautiful family, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> that daughter, she's a something special. Something else, yeah, I know. Oh, well, my. And such a nice wife. Oh, my. Still working on this time around. That's right. You're in it. <laughs> Deep in it, in the middle of life. So good, you, good you take me to... down, yeah, you take me down any road you want. All right, well, why don't we do this? Uh, solving the Communion Enigma, I went back over the life that Ann and I have spent together because I had noticed something interesting. I had noticed that in my childhood I had some very weird experiences that I wrote about in a book called The Secret School. I had completely forgotten them until I, under hypnosis with Dr. Klein, he noticed a change in my tone of voice. And I was telling about seeing these beings when I'd been on a train. I was listening to myself talking. You know, you're sort of detached from yourself when you're being hypnotized by a real pro. And uh, he suddenly says, how old are you? And I heard my voice from my little Texas childhood voice when I was, a kid, and I, I heard my voice just pops right out of my mouth without me even realizing it. Twelve. <laughs> and I thought, holy God. So, anyway, I had done that, but this all was out of my life, as I said before. From the time of about twelve until uh, until it happened again in 85. So, but Ann and I, when we were working on Solving Community Enigma, we were going over the things that had happened in our life together. And I realized something. This started up again as soon as we we met and got together. That was the catalyst for it starting up again. And it was started very strangely and very subtly with some odd experiences. We lived in a uh, on West 55th Street in Manhattan in, in an area called Clinton that was pretty ramshackle in those days. We had no money. I mean, we were couple of just broke kids. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure it's a familiar, familiar experience for you and many others. Anyway, we had a stereo, and it was on one night, but not playing anything. It was just, you know, the tuner was on, which you sometimes you leave the tuner on. And suddenly a voice came out of the tuner and started talking to us. And it, the, it, it, there was a brief exchange of, sort of banal exchange, like it said, hello, and I said, hello, and it said something like, how are you? It was a male voice, young male voice, and I said, I'm fine. Who is this? And then it said, I know something else about you. I said, what? And it was just silent. There was nothing more said. (laughs) Then a couple of days later, I was going up in the elevator, and this kind of this lady, she never struck me as crazy or anything, who lived in the building, was in it. And she was all sort of hunched up. She looked very uneasy. And she was coming up from the from the basement where there was a laundry room. And she said, there's something wrong with somebody living in this building. He looks like a corpse. <laughs> oh, boy. That's all we need. And so I go on upstairs, and I sort of forget about it. That night, I hear this strange kind of like someone rubbing on our door, sort of like they're rubbing their hands on the door, and it's making this kind of hissing sound, and that goes away after a while. And finally, and it's been quiet for a while, I hear voices, and I open the door, and I look out, and there's this blood on the wall, a streak 
of blood, like a long, you know, fingerprints of blood going down the stairwell. And I followed all the way down to the bottom floor where there's a crowd of people from the, the other floors who've seen it all come, come in and out and seen this. And they've all gone down into the into the lobby. And the, the cops show up, and uh, they try to question our superintendent, who spoke no language. He didn't speak either. He sounded like he to a person who spoke English. He sounded like someone with a very thick Spanish accent, but to someone who spoke Spanish, he didn't speak Spanish either. So we all knew that, but the cops didn't. They they couldn't get anything out of him. And finally, the cop that spoke Spanish says he doesn't speak any language, does he? Says no. We say he he does not. Anyway. It was never figured out. They cleaned up the building. But then, a couple of nights later, I'm going to the put out the trash, and I hear this noise from the floor below, this sort of funny noise. It was like a noise. I go down there, and coming around the corner is this apparition. It is like rotted the teeth are showing like the you know uh, like a person's been dead for a couple of months and the right. teeth are it's just unbelievably frightening looking sort of jerking itself along coming along the hallway and i run upstairs immediately and a second later it's 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 in our hallway i run and i close the door it's locked the door and the door is sort of pushed against for a while, and uh, then it goes away. I, I, you know, it sounds like something that in modern literature has to be shot in the head to die. Oh, God. Well, anyway, you know, but here's the thing, and you find this. I found this in talking to a lot of the people who wrote these extraordinary letters. It, when it happens to you, it feels ordinary. And it happened to me. It happened to people in my building. It was weird, but, you know, we were living it. We were with it. We were in it. You're we kind of living with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, the, uh, we, uh, we uh, anyway, what happened was I went out in the alley to look up, because they had come out of the apartment immediately below ours. I was pretty sure. And the apartment was board. The windows were boarded up from the inside. You could see there was plywood on all the windows. And uh, so I call a landlord, and I say there's this very unpleasant and weird person living in here. He's boarded up all of his windows. I want to know what's going on. And he said, this is the apartment below you. And I said, yeah, 7-H. He says, there's nobody living there. It's empty. It's, a, it's, it's vacant right now. I said, no, it's not. There's somebody living in there, and they boarded up the windows. He said, no. He said, all right, I'm sending, so I'll send someone over there today, and we will clean this place up. They get in there. It's a mess, apparently. The windows are all boarded up. There has been someone living there. They're not there now. They unboard the windows. They clean the place up. And eventually it's rented again. And who knows what what happened. But uh, he was gone. Well, good. Good for gone. Um, of course, you moved. Coming back to uh, the aliens for a moment and the dead. That's yeah. It. Very interesting, and, you know, it just occurred to me uh, when somebody named Ira sent me a wormhole message that said, isn't that what they did in contact by using Ellie's father? Remember the end of Contact? Uh, The movie Contact? I'm working. I'm not remembering the movie. Oh, the... Carl oh, movie. how could yeah. you forget? Oh, no, yes. no, I, I remember Sagan now. Movie, of course. Well, at the end, um, remember, she was reunited with, with her, her father, father who had yeah. passed away. That's right. Carl Sagan knew a lot of stuff about this. I had a couple of conversations with him, and I knew some people who were very close to him. And um, he didn't say a lot about a lot of what he knew. I think probably because it was sort of hearsay and he couldn't prove it or who knows? Maybe he was an insider, like some people say. I don't know. But he, he had – I'm not surprised. I'm not at all surprised. Can you describe in some detail – I mean, a lot of what you've said, I think, has um, uh, contributed to the modern conception of what a gray is. Yeah. Can you describe uh, – I mean, is it is it like the grays of the movies? Um 
you know, shape of the head, shape of the eyes, uh, the body size. Is is that for real? Yeah, smaller than you think. Smaller. Smaller. Yeah, smaller than you think and with capabilities that you do not expect. I'll give you an example. A one of the buildings one of the one of the houses in our little neighborhood where our cabin was, there were about six or seven other houses there at the time. Just it was just being developed and uh uh there's still there are now about twelve houses. It wasn't a very big development. But in any case, the house is just being closed in, closed up and finished up, finished out as they say. Roof's been put on it and one of the workmen's got all of his tools in there, so he decides he's going to stay in there for the night with his tools because he can't move them out until the morning because there's a big lot of tools and his his coworker is got the truck, so he's there with his car, and uh, he stays there the night. He is awakened in the middle of the night and he's horrified to see this little creature in the room, in the same type of creature that Raven Dana would see in our cabin a little while, right. a few years later, um, uh, which is a story I haven't told yet, but we'll get to. In any case, he sees this thing, and it's about three feet tall with the big eyes, and it's standing there like a deer caught in headlights. He experiences a terrific burst of fear. Well, which you can understand, I mean, because an animal, unlike any animal he has ever seen before, is inside the house with him in the middle of the night, and he's all alone. Of course. And and not only that, he it's dark, and he can't see it all that well. He grabs his flashlight and turns the flashlight on, shines it on this thing for a couple of seconds, whereupon... It turns into what looks to him like a bird of paradise, a bird. That <laughs> happened in our cabin, too. It was a different type of bird. Uh, and it, gen it disappears by going straight out through the closed doors, right through the glass without breaking it. Uh, <laughs> tools are no tools. He gets in his car and goes home. Immediately later, he came the next day and got his tools. He told me this story after he read Communion. And I might say, incidentally, speaking of that, on the night it happened, there was a witness. This I did not know until years after the book was, pu was published. I wish I had known. The witness was a friend who lived in the same area. He was the guy who was building the houses, a good friend at the time, in fact. And he, was, he and his wife were coming home from a party. This is, this is during Christmas time, and there were a lot of parties, at about 2 o'clock in the morning. And they saw in a field near our houses what looked to him like the Goodyear blimp uh, down in a field. And here he is a, uh, say, trooper. So he figures, I'm going to stop, and, and if this thing has crashed. I'm going to stop and help, see if I can help anybody. Pulls over, goes out into the field, and he begins to hear someone screaming inside this thing. So he starts to run toward it. All of a sudden, it bright, it's lit with bright lights. He can no longer hear the screaming, and it starts coming toward him, making a growling noise, like, Arr! and his wife goes into a hissy fit and completely freaks out in the car, of course, I mean, you know, as you want to understand. And he figures, this is perhaps not for me, after all, since it does seems to be under, under control. And he goes back to the car and he drives away. He reads communion about a year later, and about a year after that. He says to me, you know, Whitley, I've got to tell you something I'm very ashamed to tell you about, but I was there on the night this happened to you. I saw it, and I ran. And I said to him, good for you, smart move. <laughs> he was relieved to hear that, but I was glad. I, w I was sad that I hadn't ever had him. He was not willing to go witness. By that time, he had retired from the troopers, but he was n not willing to bear witness publicly. And I can understand that. You know what? Maybe it's time to take a second and um, talk about witnesses. Uh, Whitley, you've got an implant that was. W they implanted you at some point. Uh, Somebody did. 
Yes, uh, during one of these experiences. Yeah, you, I can tell you all about it. I was wide awake. Implant in your ear, correct? In May of 1989, that's correct. It says May of, 80, of 94. In all right, you, you tell me about how it happened, and then we'll discuss the witnesses that I know about. I will tell you precisely what happened. Uh, it was a May evening. It was warm. The windows were open in our bedroom. At 11.30 at night, I was up reading. Annie was asleep. Uh, I had just turned out the light when I noticed a figure standing in the doorway of the room, which was at the foot of the bed, about 10 feet across or 15 feet across of the bedroom. Now, situation is this. This is a new cap, bigger. Uh, there is a bank of lights which is beside the bed, which I can flip on and completely flood the outside of the cabin with floodlights all around the cabin. Underneath the bed is a loaded Benelli riot gun. In the uh, bedside table is a little pistol, an AMT backup, a difficult pistol to use, but I do know how to use it. And I'm, very, and I'm with you all the way. I'd have guns, too. Yeah, well, exactly. So I'm good with this pistol. I know my both of my weapons, and I know how to use them, and I'm willing. Uh, so I see these two people. I've just turned out the light within a few minutes, standing up. People, people, a woman, and behind her, a man. They are standing there. And now, but this time I was not afraid of the little gray guys. I would not have thought of, uh, I was meditating with them and stuff. I would not have dreamed of coming after them with a gun. But this was people, and I was scared because I figured someone's coming after me, which had already happened a number of times. Um, and uh, I hear in the backyard a voice say very quietly, condition red, oh, I forgot, I, I was Disturbed by the sound of gravel crunching in the driveway right before all of this happened, but the sound of a car moving silently toward the house. In other words, it is someone who had gotten past our locked gate and fencing and everything, and that was not good news. So I was I was ready to turn on the lights when I saw the people. Then I decided, change of plan, go for the shotgun. The next moment, I'm lying on my side, literally had been going for the shotgun, and I can't move and I can't see. I can still hear, and I can still feel. The woman's voice is saying something gentle and soothing. I don't know what it was. I've, I've never been able to remember it. The man, apparently the man, I assume it was the man, is pressing something against the side of my head and pushing it down, like, into the – he's pressing against the, my, my left temple and ear and almost pushing my head down into the pillow. Then it ends and I leap up, grab the shotgun. There's all this crashing in the woods. There's a big flash of light. I turn on all the floods. I grab the shotgun. The alarm system is still armed. It's still red. It's not been disturbed. I run through the whole house. I even go up through the attic. I do everything down in the basement. Nothing. Every window is closed. Every door is locked. I finally go back to bed thinking there must have been some kind of bizarre, vivid nightmare or something. I'm, you know, I'm always the type of person who always looks for one of these ordinary explanations, even though I don't get those much. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I sort of sleep. Get up in the morning, tell Ann the story, start to go out and get the paper. I usually drive out and get the paper every morning to a little newsstand a couple miles away. So uh, get in the car. I notice immediately that the garage door is wide open, even though the alarm system is still armed. I disarm the system. I get in the car. The car is filled with static electricity. I think it is probably going to blow up on me, I jump out of the car again and run back into the house. Everything seems okay then. The car gets okay after a few minutes, 15 or 20 minutes. I call the alarm guy and I say there's something wrong with the system. The garage door was wide open, but the alarm system was, was not, it didn't activated. sound activated. It didn't, didn't go off, yeah. He comes over immediately. He's a friend. We 
we've had we know each other pretty well. He comes over and he tests the system and there's this enormously powerful magnetic field around the switch on the garage door. That the thing is a magnetic field has to be generated by something. It's not like a radio wave. Of course. But there's nothing there. There's nothing there except this little dinky magnet that's part of the switch and it's like the magnet has been just supercharged somehow. We can't figure it out. He finally shifts it out, puts in a new system thing in the system. It's working fine. Uh, not quite the end of the story. Here's what happens next. A couple days later, my ear starts hurting, and I feel my ear. And there's a bump in it. I think, what, now, where in the heck did that come from? Of so I go to the doctor. He says he thinks it's a little cyst. I do not think it's a little cyst. I know about implants at this point. And I don't say anything like that to him. Eventually, I end up with another doctor uh, who is willing to take it out. And he's been on coast with me and you, in fact. Yeah, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. You've yeah. also had instances, have you not, Whitley, where your ear will suddenly turn oh, beet red. It turned on at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio in the presence of the director of material science, Dr. William Mar Mallow. He right. saw it happen. Right. He saw it. He rushed me into a signals acquisition laboratory, and they said they couldn't pick up any signal from it. But the problem is the lab is funded more than 50% by the central intelligence, by the intelligence communities. So who knows whether they picked up anything or not? They wouldn't necessarily be able to even tell me. Okay, well, you went to the doctor, and uh, and they he thought it was a little cyst, maybe. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. They thought it was a little cyst. Did they do any imaging at all before they yeah. opened you? Yeah, and then the next ray. And it was it was shadowy on the x-ray. Not You couldn't see it. It didn't look like what it was at all. Let me put it that way. And, all right, uh, but they knew something, something was there. there. Oh, yeah. They, they knew all right, now, I, I should just rush ahead and tell the audience, look, I had Dr. Roger Lear on. I had the surgeon who operated on Whitley on. I can't recall his name. Dr. John Lerma was his name. Okay, fine. And uh, they both came on together and said, look, we opened up Whitley, his ear, and we went after this thing. And I, I'm not, I know that I'm not exaggerating when I say the surgeon told us on air that as they approached this item, when they had you open, and he took the, the scalpel and went to actually cut where this thing was and remove it, and the damn thing moved. Down. It in moved. Yeah, that's right, into an area where they said they didn't want to keep going because it was getting, I guess, near uh, something very sensitive. No, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't sensitive. It moved from the top of my ear all the way down into my earlobe, and the doctor yeah, well, said I'd have to cut your whole ear off to get it. Exactly. In other words, they didn't want to chase it with a scalpel. Right. I mean, I didn't want them to either. I want the ear. But that was a surgeon I like the folks, ears. My on ears. my program who said this happened. Right. It happened. And the tape of the operation is, again, it's on my website. Uh, the video of, it, of him actually doing the surgery with Ann nervously laughing in the background. And then he says it's a white disc, and a few seconds later he sees it disappear. You can see it yep. all happen. Right. Anyway, he got a corner of it. And that went to... Bio, to the pathology lab. Right. A couple of days later, the pathologist calls him up. Now, this at this point, this is still in the down in the bottom of my ear. Understand, when it was put in, it was there was no scar whatsoever. There was no incision mark. There was nothing. Then right. afterwards, it was just as smooth. It just it's like I'm feeling it right now as we're talking. It's still there. Anyway, the pathologist calls him and says, "Is this a practical joke?" He says, no, it came out of a patient. He said, because this is not natural. This is a piece of technology. It's a piece of, it has a metallic base, and there are cilia, proteinaceous material, growing out of that base, and these cilia are motile. They were moving. Or they, they weren't anymore, but they had been, he, he thought. And, of course, the cilia were what may enable it to move. Now, a couple days later, it had moved from the earlobe back up into the top of my ear where it had remained to this day because I, I got afraid of taking it out again, despite Roger Lear's many, many uh, efforts to get me to take it out, try to take it out again. I don't want to try. I'm scared to. 
I, I, I don't blame you a bit. I, one time's uh, enough. If, one, you can't, yeah. if you can't catch it with a scalpel, don't have the race. Right, exactly. And uh, yeah. I, I, I was just thinking, did it move for its safety, for my safety, or for both of our safeties? I don't know, and I can't find out. And I'm not going to tempt that again. So there it sits. Uh, and what, what effect to this day? Um, what, is there anything that... It still turns on once the blue moon. It not all turns on. Yeah. Uh, it, what do you feel or you what senses do you... You hear a twang noise in the ear and a uh, its ear turns gets hot and turns bright red. All right. Hold tight. Hold tight. Stay right there. So, you know, the surgeon came on and told me all about it. But that's pretty strong evidence in my mind, along with Dr. Roger Weir. I mean, very, very strong evidence. This is just strange stuff. But then again, this is dark matter. That's the number, and I'll tell you what. Back in Washington, D.C., clear the lines. Let's take some calls. Uh, that'll take a few moments. Uh, we'll clear the lines. They'll begin to ring. And um, and I've got a couple of things I want to touch on with Whitley, and then we'll begin to take calls. <sighs> what a story. Um, if this doesn't get you and grip you, I don't know what will. The number to call is a simple one, 855-REAL-UFO. That's 855-REAL-UFO, or put the other way, 1-855-732-5836. That's 855-732-5836. All right. Whitley, um, here's what I want to raise with you. Um, one criticism that people would have of you is that you've made a lot of money with this story. Now, it's true. I mean, you're a writer. Uh, you took off. You wrote Communion, a giant bestseller. You and I wrote a book. In other words, you've written and written about these experiences, and you've done very well by them. And that always makes people suspicious. Like my answer would be, what would you expect a guy to do? He's a writer. But why don't you go ahead and uh, and tell us your take on that? Well, first of all, the money illusion. Uh, here's my take on that. Yes, I made a, a nice piece of money for communion. But then there followed the many years, which you are aware of, of not making any money at all because once South Park's pilot came out, my sales ended because nobody wants to buy a book uh, by a guy who is a laughing stock. Nobody. The result is my sales dropped the first year after it came out 70%. Now, by looking back, I'm down... On an average book, I sell about 3% of what I sold in the before I wrote Communion, before I even published mm-hmm. Communion. Right. Um, nobody bought Solving a Communion Enigma, and nobody will, because it's by Whitley Strieber. Uh, I'm hoping that people will, will be interested enough in Alien Hunter to buy it. It's a wonderful book. Uh, I'm hoping they will change their minds and buy Alien Hunter and realize that just because you're telling the truth doesn't mean you should be tuned out. It means you should be tuned in. Uh, in any case, I lost the cabin. I went bankrupt. I have spent many years past the money, and I'm still telling this story. And I won't stop because what happened to me, the way I was rejected, made me furious, and I, I'm just not going to stop. It would me, too. Make me well, very angry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you remember in the old days, I would come on that show, on your show, literally desperate to do something that would make a little bit of money so that I could keep my roof over my head. I mean, we went from being wealthy, wealthy writer, that I write communion, that lasts for a few years, and the whole thing is in a shambles because I wrote communion. I'm the communion man. I'm the rectal probe man. I am the laughing stock. How ironic 
That must have been very hurtful. It um, was. It wasn't hurtful so much as infuriating because, you know, these books: Communion, Transformation, Breakthrough, The Secret School, Confirmation, Solving Communion Enigma. They're true. And you'd think people would eat that up, but they run away from it. But you put out some UFO book that's full of lies, and it becomes a bestseller. Mm-hmm. You know, that's really – I thought to myself, well, maybe they thought I was lying when I wrote Communion, and that's why everybody bought it. And then they realized, oh, no, he's telling the truth. We can't buy those anymore. But that, that's not quite right. People get fooled, and by experts, there are people in the government – and I think outside of it, too, called social engineers who are social scientists who, like, if you go on YouTube, you can find some of their work very easily and look at UFO videos on YouTube. The better videos will have these real Internet troll type of comments on them. (laughs) And often, if you click on that individual, you'll find, He's just a, a, a name. He's never done anything else. He's just sitting there. And he's been put there by a social engineer. He's not real. It's not a real person. To, for the purpose of creating the impression that the public thinks this is all ridiculous. But the public does not think that. The public is willing, ready, and able to listen. But they don't get the chance. Like solving the community, but... You'd never see it in a bookstore because the books, bookstore owners believe Whitley Strieber created a literary hoax. He's a liar. He doesn't deserve to be on our shelves. They've been duped. They're the victims of social engineering. Victims. Because remember this. You know, the disclosure people always say, well, we're going to get disclosure. We're going to do this. We're gonna... Forget it. It is never going to happen, and I'll tell you why. I told them this. There's one of them out there. I won't say the name. It's not. It's not uh, uh, Steve Greer, uh, who is who w- w- tries to pretend that the abductees and the close encounter witnesses don't exist. I told to this individual. I said, "Look, this is what will happen." She, he, this individual is trying to get a statement from NASA where they will say that simply that some of the objects that are observed in the sky may be under intelligent control, not even that they're aliens, that not anything like And I said, it's never going to happen because no matter what they say, they're exactly two steps away from the question, well, what about these people who say they are being abducted? And that is a question the government does not want to deal with because the answer is we can't stop it and we're not going to tell you what it is, even if we did know and we don't know. Okay. Uh, the number is 855-REAL-UFO, and you're on the air with Whitley Streeter. Hi. Hello. How's it going, Art Bell? Very well, thank you. Uh, very 51, do you? And uh, Mr. Uh, Weaver, I've got Streeter, a question. Streeter. Whitley I'll Streeter. Be- Look, do I really need to talk to him if he can't even pronounce my name? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, try it. Say Streber, and I'll answer. Streber. Uh, uh, you, you, can't even, you can't even, you don't want to say it. Well, so, so what's your question? I'm one of these people that have never had one of these experiences, and I'm kind of curious, is there a specific uh, type of person that has them, or can anybody have them, or how well, do you that, know that's actually it? a reasonable question, and I stand corrected, because I thought that you were going to come after me. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's a very good question, and I have a part of an answer, and this is what it is, that when you get a large group of these people together, you find out something very interesting about them. They're all very mild-mannered. Uh, the ones I've had take IQ tests are generally pretty smart. They're generally not all that well-educated. In other words, they don't have college degrees, et cetera, and so forth. So they're bright people kind of in the ordinary walk of life, and they're they're mild people. They're not the kind of people you would expect to have a fight. I'm one of the more belligerent ones, actually. Uh, 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 but uh, in any case, th- that would be one thing. And another thing is this, and this, it, 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 we noticed this when we were getting going working with the letters. We'd make long lists of the names of these people, and there were an awful lot of Irish and 
uh, uh, Scottish type names in there. And we found that the groups of people who this happened most often to were people of Celtic descent, uh, people of uh, Native American descent, Very interesting. Uh, people of Jewish descent, and people of black descent. One time I was with a black family that had five generations of a great-great-grandmother over 100 years old, all of whom had experiences. It was amazing. All right. I, I think it, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, caller. I, uh, I cut him off by mistake. Uh, Whitley, I don't think people are going to come in after you, not, not on this program. Uh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm ready. We've for got kind of a different group. Of, well, right. be ready yeah, I will, for them. But no, I, 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 will, I will not be argumentative. I'll be good. I'll be very, very nice. I'll be very polite and sweet, which I am often not on the air, as you know. Yeah, I know, but I don't, I don't think you need to worry about these okay. people, really. I'm I going to assume that, that they're all wonderful people and we're going to have a lovely time. Bring well, them on. I hope, hope you're right. All right, you're on the air with Whitley Strieber. Hi. Hey. Whitley? Yes, ma'am. Uh, or is it sir? I, it's ma'am. It's Emily. I talked to you back in 01 in Hawaii. And you had called me about some films I sent you, and I just wanted to thank you for being so personable and hospitable about it. Uh, you had, you and Ann had looked at them, and I've had several encounters, and a lot of films went here, there, and everywhere, and you were the only one that responded, and I appreciate that. And in 07, my son and I moved back to East Texas, and I had a face-to-face -face encounter with a giant Bigfoot, and you talked about people laughing and making fun of you. I know exactly what you're saying. No, it you happens to me. I just kind of keep it under my wraps here. But I just wanted to touch base with you. And I love you. I love your work. I understand where you've been and what you're doing as much as I possibly can. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I certainly know where you're coming from with a Bigfoot experience. And I, any of these experiences, folks, I would not recommend you tell this to anyone. Uh, I'm too many bad stories about that. And or at least, before, you know, think really, really hard before you do it. Yeah, uh, because there's like a lot around, coming around the office or at work, or because uh, people will go after you. Well, exactly. I mean, you're going to have to expect a certain amount of ridicule, is the word. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what it is. You're on the air with Whitley Strieber. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi Art. <laughs> Nay Roswell to you, sir. Um actually a very very new listener. I've only listened to three uh three shows now and I love it. I'm addicted. Um I drive a truck so and I don't even drive throughout the night. I I just listen to you just, just to listen to you. And uh uh Mr. Whitley, uh, I have to say that honestly, um I've never actually found the anal probing to be humorous. I've always found it as a serious matter and, and uh and uh, I, of I don't have it's any... a serious matter. Of exactly. Serious. And, you know, I, I could never understand why people um, could make fun or make light of a situation such as yours. When I was listening to your story uh, in the beginning, and um, I just like goosebumps, and uh, I've, I've never had a, a UFO encounter. I've always been uh, not skeptical. I've always been um, always been interested in UFOs and, and aliens and, and uh, abductions and sightings and things of that nature. Um, and now that I have this resource, it's just amazing. I've been looking at all the uh, the, uh, the websites and I've been uh, browsing yours, and I'm I'm thinking of subscribing. But um, my question actually is, uh, as far as the implant that is in your ear, you said you said that they, that you've had two surgeries, correct? Right? One, 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 one. Okay, so the, the one one surgery and it, it, it would move. And he, no, like the one I told you about, I have the surgeon on the air. He said it moved, period. Yes, yes, sir. And uh, is there, I mean, have you thought of maybe of alternative ways, of possibly like freezing? I'm not saying like before the surgery, you know, somehow immobilize, immobilizing it to where you could get freezing. Well, that, actually, that's a pretty interesting question. Uh, yeah, it is an interesting question, but uh, I'm not so sure I'm how interested I am in freezing my ear enough to where the thing would not move. But here's, a, <laughs> here's the bigger issue. What happens to me if it's taken out? I, because I can't answer that question. It could be I'll be better. It's a good point. Could be I'll be worse, maybe much worse. I don't know the answer. And without knowing the answer, I'd like to wait until I'm 
damn well finished with this life before I take another shot at it. That may be when you learn about the next chapter. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Uh, let's see. You're on the air with Whitley Strieber. Hello. Hello? Hello. It's Dark Matter. You're on the air. Hi. This is Tim calling from Louisiana. Hi there. Hi. I'm Art uh, Roswell to you. And uh, Mr. Strieber, fascinating story. Uh, the reason I'm calling in is I had something to share. Uh, I didn't know it, but you kept mentioning communion throughout the program, and then it just rang a bell. And uh, so I, I Googled it, looked it up, and communion in 1987. Was that when it was published? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, my little brother and my mother one day, I uh, grew up in Sturgis, Michigan, and we grew up in about two acres of property with uh, multiple cornfields around us. And uh, it's, he was six years old. And uh, my brother, my other brothers and I, I've got uh, four brothers. We were all at school. And my mom was out hanging laundry. And... Uh, she had seen like a dark shadow or something like that, excuse me, or something, but we had a bunch of walnut trees and everything in our yard, so she just thought it was maybe clouds or something casting a shadow. And uh, something told her something, you know, wasn't right. I don't know. How, I can't remember exactly how she described it. She looked to her left, and my little brother William always, always stood by her side and wanted to help with the laundry, but he was gone, and she couldn't find him. Well, uh, she ran around like some brush that's in our yard, stuff like that, and there he was staring up at the sky. She went over there and told him not to run, you know, run away anymore. Are you guys still with me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, so she took him inside, and nothing became anything, you know, the rest of the day until we got home. And then she asked us to watch my uh, little brother, and she went to uh, went to the store, and then she made some other errands. She came back home, and when she got back home, you know, it was one of our favorite things was, you know, to go through the bag and see what Mom got, you know. And uh, I, I was digging through the bags, and I took this book out, and it happened to be your book. I think this was around spring of 87. And That'd be about when it was published, too. Yeah. Uh, so I took it. It might have been the summer. I, I took the book, and I put it on the counter, and I was looking at it. I go, oh, what is that? And I was like, oh, I've seen those on television, you know. That's an alien or something, you know, whatever. And I made a comment about it to my mom, and then uh, we didn't think anything of it, you know, put the groceries away and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden we were all, you know, kind of like walking through, and my little brother was staring at it. He was laughing. And he said, I know that man. And I, this is a true story. I'm 43 years old. I don't tell lies, and I've never seen any UFOs in my life. But uh, come to find out, when my little brother took off from my mom's side that day, there was a craft in the air. And he said that he saw that man in that craft. And wow. It, oh, that, 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 that would be you, Whitley. <laughs> Me? No, 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 no. No, I'm no, he means the front William. cover, not the back. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> front cover. <laughs> anyway, I thought I would call and share that. Um, I, I believe you. I totally believe you. Um, I follow this stuff. I try to. I'm fascinated with it, but uh, I've never seen anything myself. Maybe someday I will, but I never want to have to go through the experience that you went through. And Anyway, Roswell's again to you guys, and uh, thanks for taking my call. <laughs> Thank you very much for the story. <laughs> I thought he saw you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so that's happened, too, but so far. So far uh, it wouldn't surprise me as many times as you've experienced uh, that somebody oh, would see you in transport. I think that we are all involved in this. I don't think it's I don't think it's just certain people. I think certain people remember it or are allowed to remember it. But I think it's part of human life. Yeah. I, I, I'm not I, you know the idea that aliens came here recently and started you know us it doesn't wash with me. I think this is part of what we are. And oh, I, think, I, I think so. Uh, I and think I think are, it goes back since, well, when people were writing on rocks, carving on rocks. Absolutely. From time immemorial. And uh, uh, we are part of, well, you know, we're caterpillars and they're butterflies. And I guess if you were a caterpillar and saw a butterfly, you might find it very disturbing looking. <laughs> and, and we find these guys pretty hideous. But. Uh, what that fellow said to Laurie Barnes, one day, my dear, you will look just like us, I think is the future of many of us. I think also that, very disturbing from my point of view. You're, you're on the air with Whitley Strieber. Hello. Hello? Hello. Hello. It's me. It is. Well, what do you know? Oh, Roswell's in Stonia's to the art. That's how much we missed you in the distance. Thank yeah. You. Um, I was wondering if you've heard of Riley Martin. He does another talk show on Sirius um, on 101. 
on Tuesdays, and he's wrote a book, The Coming of Tan. He's uh, he said he was abducted as a child. It's been years, and they finally gave him his memories back, and now he remembers everything. And man, he's got a long story to tell. Have you heard of him? Or no, I have not. You hadn't, huh? No, actually, you I, have. To... I have. You have I've, I've, I've heard of him. I have not heard the show, but um, uh, another experiencer, apparently. Well, that's yeah. great. I mean, the, the, he has a show and everything. It's a good sign. Maybe people start to get used to this. Well, we're hoping so. I mean, uh, <laughs> I I figure there they got to be somebody else out there. You know, we can't be alone in this universe. There's somebody else think, in here too. <laughs> I really, uh, Woodley, I just don't think that um, people are going to, no matter how we tell it, they're just going to be too uncomfortable to accept it. Uh, particularly in the way you've laid it out with the dead, that part. Really, but that's what it's all about. Well, I guess so. But that's, and, that's and, the whole and thinking back on what somebody said here, John Lear really did reference all of this. It may not be quite the same thing, but it's yeah. the same track. Yeah, it is sort of the same track, except it's a very it's a very negative reference to it. And I'm not so sure that, that it is negative? all that negative. I mean, think, I think well. that, I think that if you've got heavy things on your soul. You should think carefully about that. You know, my wife's uh, on our website. Uh, she's been she's been really working on. She had a uh, near death experience in 2004 that taught her that you need to give up the burdens of life, the hates and the angers and all those things. And she's written some beautiful diaries in the and diary section of, of unknowncountry.com about forgiveness and that and how to forgive yourself and others and, and and I think that's a very important part of this whole experience of being human and uh I've come uh, to learn that too Woodley but it's easier said than done well it is easier it's very hard to do it's very hard to really do it uh but you know I think if we die die heavy it's not so good I think we should Die as light as we can when that, when our time comes. I think that's part of the part of the uh, message of our experience, of certainly my in an experience, and maybe part of what our message about the soul is about. That the soul is very real, and it is why we're here, and uh, we need to live compassionate and forgiving lives. Uh, and it, that's hard to do. It's harder to do than it sounds. All right, you're on the air with Whitley Strieber. Good, good evening or morning, whatever. Hello. Yeah, hello. Yes. Yeah, this is Bob. Um, I was wondering. I got kind of a truthful question. Is there any way to these little blue guys? Did did you summon them in, or did they just happen? Yeah, I can't. And I was wondering it. if maybe they're. Wait, wait a minute. Repeat right? your question. Uh, please repeat your question. The little blue guy. What about the little blue guys? I. Does he? Is there any way to get them to come to you, or do they just show up? And are they related to these shadow people I've heard you talk about before? <laughs> well, I don't know about question. that, but it is well, is it really a good question? Okay. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, we were able to get the, these beings, and there's two types that are in my life, and a uh, uh, third type also. I will say, these tall blonde creatures, but uh, that's another story. Uh, part of my story. Uh, in any case, the two that are the most alien looking are these little short, very short, dark blue creatures and the very fragile gray colored creatures with the big eyes. There's two different types. And they often come together. And uh, uh, in my life and in the lives of many, many other close encounter witnesses. Now, Anne was able to a couple of times, two or three times, to get groups of people to the cabin, and they would, the visitors showed up definitely, in no questions whatsoever about it, in complex, elaborate experiences that were not hallucinations or dreams on anybody's part. Uh, mostly, when they came, they just came. Now, I spent many years meditating. I meditate daily. I was doing that when this started. Uh, I was open to it. Uh, 
and uh, I was I was there for it. And how how important is that? If you want this to happen, God forbid, I don't know why anybody would want this to happen. But if you do, is meditation um, one direction to go? Well, I think meditation is important. I mean, there are people out there who will make you pay a lot of money to go out and shoot laser beams, laser pointers at the sky and stuff. Uh, but I think uh, it's a much more personal and deeper experience. And uh, now I meditated for, what, 30 years, 25 years, 20 years. I guess I've been made 85, 75. I've been meditating for about 20 years before this happened in my life. And I wasn't looking for it when it did. I was open, though. And I guess they sensed that or were aware of it or saw it in some way. But then subsequently, when I was learning to communicate with them, meditation was absolutely essential. And in the last three years of our time at the cabin, I meditated nightly with a group of someones. I don't know what they were exactly, but uh, they, they well, came. Well, consider what you've said tonight. You, you got raped. You've yeah. had an implant put in your ear. You've had experiences that I don't think anybody would want to have. Why and, would anybody want this? And I keep going toward it. And, Art, the answer to that question is very hard for me also. Why didn't I immediately sell the cabin or burn the damn thing down and never go back? Mm. Mm. Uh, I don't know why I am compelled to do this, except that I, I just sense, and I can't get away from this, that it's about the truth and it's terribly important, and I, I won't quit. I keep hoping that at some time in the future, maybe long after I'm gone, it's like Bud Hopkins used to hope, that this will come into focus in some way and that all of the effort that I have expended and that others, so many others have expended and that the, the struggles that the Close Encounter Witnesses have had in their lives will all turn out to be worth it, that we will turn out to have created a foundation that the future can build on. That's I, hope I hope you're right. I, I, hope I, I, I hope I yeah. am. I really hope you're right. All right, hold tight. We'll take a break here. It's hard to even understand why somebody would be compelled to continue to seek this out after everything he described. Beyond my uh, ability to digest, this is God Matter. That is the number. My guest is Woodley Strieber, and the story is very, very serious. We're going to continue to take calls. Uh, they're stacked like cordwood, and so, Whitley, if you're there, uh, we're going to go right back to the phones. I'm here. And here we go. Uh, you're on the air with Whitley Strieber and Dark Matter. Good evening. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? I hear you. Great. Whitley, this summer... I listened to an interview you did with a gentleman by the name of, I believe, David Politis. Yes. And it made me go out and buy all three of his books, and you wrote, I think, the four to the third one. Um, and it was it was a terrifying interview. It was very interesting material, and I was just wondering, um, since you kind of took that on and obviously seemed interested in supporting this gentleman, do you have any thoughts to – maybe people who go missing are involved in some of what you've experienced or yeah i have thought that i have thought that there are some people who maybe go into this and don't come back that has concerned me a lot and while david's stories don't have any there's nothing in any of them that that uh uh would indicate that that does happen. I, I just, I'm not so sure I see why it wouldn't. Uh, you know, in other words, I have a feeling that there may be some people who go deeply into this. I know, I know a, ca a few cases of people 
who have gone into it in another way, who have, who have kind of, the visitors have come deep into their lives and they kind of roll up the carpet. In other words, they, they live, they go way back in the woods and live very simply and quietly by themselves because, you know, Art, you've been talking about how this is so scary and so on and so forth. But there's another side to this, and, and that's that, that once you get past the hard stuff, if you do, which I eventually did, obviously, I wouldn't have kept, kept doing it, it becomes uh, like um, like being part of a larger world. It's, it's an extraordinary and beautiful experience And on the one hand. Now, on the other hand, one of the stories that David has in one of his books took place. A young guy, kid, was out partying in the woods and at night. And uh, when the party was over and everybody had gone home, he was no longer there. He was gone. And he stayed gone. There's never been a trace of him found. That happened a couple of miles from the cabin where I used to go out in the woods all the time and meet the visitors. Not only that, it happened apparently on or very close to an, in, an incident where they were trying very hard to get me to come with them, and I wouldn't do it. So I have to say I think it is a possibility. Yes, and don't you think that if you had decided that you would be willing to go, you'd be gone? I decided, I, well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. I had made a plan with them, and it wasn't like sitting across a table and talking to someone. It happened in your head, and it felt like your imagination, but at the same time, then, then it would come become real, and I had gotten to the point where I was used to that. I was handling that pretty well, and the plan was that they would call me, and I even built a bench in a certain place in the woods where we would, I would go sit, and one of them would come sit beside me, and we would talk. That was the idea, and the call came just at dawn one February morning in the cold, uh, in the form of a sound like a trumpet echoing across the woods and, and, and waking me up in the cabin. I knew what it was immediately. It was un I mean, there was nothing else was going to make that noise like that. And I'd never heard it before, but it was just so otherworldly. It was obviously something to do with them. So I threw on my slippers. I had a pair of good, thick slippers and a big robe, and I went out into the woods. And I, to do that, you had to go over a deck and then cross a yard and then up a little rise. And then below the, beyond the rise was the woods, and then beyond that, the clearing where the first experience had taken place, I was pretty sure. So... I go up on the little rise, and I can see through the naked winter woods an object, a big dark object in that clearing, and I can see a couple of figures standing near it. And I can hear it. It's making a clanking noise, and uh, that clanking noise is very familiar because when these things slow down, I mean, people think of flying saucer, oh, I must make a you know, very otherworldly whirring noise. Believe me, it's it's all much more down to earth when you're close to it than you would think. In any case, it was there. And I thought, oh, my, they are here. It's going to happen. And I started to walk down into the woods, and I stopped for a second. And I heard this voice. It, it, it was these blue guys again, the tough ones, going, come on, come on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought to myself, if I walk down there, and I never come back, what happens to my family, my son and my wife lying there in the bed and what she's going through, and she goes through every night when I go out, and she won't talk about, but she won't stop me, but I know she lives in a kind of hell because of this. Maybe you were supposed to be considering that, Woodley. Maybe well, that exactly. Was it. Yeah. And I turned around, and I went back to the house. When I put my hand on the doorknob, walk into the house, there came from above the woods three cries. The sounds remain to this day the most emotional 
most beautiful, most heart-rending sounds I have ever heard, and also the most perfectly executed sounds. They were so perfectly timed together, and it's hard to explain this, but it, they were like hearing something perfect, like like a voice of perfection. And uh, so much so that I love classical music. I couldn't listen to it for nearly a year afterwards. It sounded like mud compared to that little second of those sounds. So beautiful, so filled with regret, so filled with emotion. And then I find out a little while later, this kid just disappeared down the road. Yeah. And what am I to think? And there's other even darker stories, Art. Darker. Maybe he wanted it, um, and you didn't. You know, here Maybe comes he the question. Maybe he went to a good place, but God, who knows? Well, that's right. Um, here comes a question on behalf of many people. You know, I keep getting, getting these uh, messages when I'm on the air, and this one uh, represents many people. Please ask Whitley if he thinks there's any chance that these creatures could be demonic. Of course. Certainly. Well, I mean, I on the one hand, I mean, I'm you have a picture that but... t- tells the terrible things they've done to you, but then on the other hand, you say actually good things about them I at think times. So that's why we call them the grays because it is a gray area. It is it has a dark side to it, and it has a light side to it. I went through the dark tunnel of this thing, through the dark labyrinth, and on the other side, I came to a level of it which was richly educational, informative, and transformative. And, you know, the man, the wonderful man who wrote the introduction to solving the communion enigma, Jeff Kripal. Jeff is a, uh, a, a religious scholar of the first rank, and uh, he said to me, he said, Whitley, what you need to understand about this is there is such a thing as the dangerous sacred. He is the chairman of religious studies at Rice University. Uh, and uh, he, he said, you have to understand this, that it is not all sweetness and light just mm. because there is an element of holiness about it. Holiness can be dark. No. And, but at any given moment, uh, if contact begins, there is no way to know. Oh, you're, you're, you're walking into the unknown. Contact, it, it, listen, if contact became general, all over the earth, yes. uh, it, that would mean that it was demonic because we are, n- we are not going to be able to take it. It's hard to take, terribly hard to take, even when you've had it in your life for years. The most recent time the visitor showed up in my life in this apartment was an incredibly, in where I live now in California, incredibly beautiful devastatingly difficult experience because they are just so alive and so powerful. They're physically small, but, you know, it's like an elephant trying to deal with an ant when, in terms of the mental power of it, and it's just overwhelming. It's hard. The emotional towering, emotional complexity and, and, and intensity, the breathtaking scope of the mind it's it's appalling and you know i'm telling you right now i can take it for a few minutes i know people who can take it for longer but when i see these things about supposed air force people interviewing the aliens and stuff i think to myself come on what b s is this these people have no idea what this is really about they're smoking Uh, All right, uh, here we are again. We've got so many people waiting. Uh, you're on the air with Whitley Schreiber. Hi. Hello. Art. Yes. Welcome back. Thank you. Whitley. Hello. Yes, we're here. Uh, Blue Doctors. What's that? Yes. Uh, um, what were they? Why do you call them doctors? I'm yeah. curious. Um, the book, were they doctors or? Well, uh, some people referred to them, they referred to themselves in some cases as doctors. 
and I thought really? of them as sort of soul doctors or something. Yeah, the little doctors. They used to call themselves that. Uh, so maybe that's what they are. Well, you obviously uh, mentioned that somewhere, Whitley. He did yeah, pull that out. along the line. Yeah. But I yeah. remember that um, um, it was um, a walk-in that played uh, you in the movie. Christopher Walken did, yeah. He played somebody in the movie. It wasn't me, but it was, oh. in any case, that's another story entirely. Did you get, uh, by the way, did you get to um, a consult on that? Uh, I wrote a script. They basically threw it over their shoulders and made a movie. There are a couple of scenes in it that I actually are, yeah, I'm, I wasn't, I, I, I thought the movie had a good, some good points, but they messed up the special effects, in my opinion. I, I don't think the effects were very good, and uh, uh, Christopher Walken's over-the-top performance was meant to mock me, and I knew that, and I found that very annoying. You're on the air with Whitley Strieber. Good evening. Yeah, uh, good evening. How are you? Fine. Um, my question is, because I've heard lots of interviews, and how does he know he hasn't been programmed um, or being programmed by the dent plant? Because one of the things that Whitley said was, don't go into the light, go into the dark. No, I think that was uh, John Lear, actually. Yeah, but he said Whitley told him that. No, I, I didn't yeah, tell I think, John I think Lear. that's right. I didn't, well, that right? I did not tell him that. I didn't tell him anything like that. And uh, But it does sound like something I might have said, uh, simply because I went into the dark, and I found, it, I found it very interesting, actually, after a while. Scary, but interesting. I remember uh, John Lear saying yeah, that, and I think he was quoting you. He might have been, and uh, I, can, I can well imagine myself saying it. But uh, I remember uh, because I mean, it's bothered me ever since. Why? <laughs> I went into the what, what do you mean? Woods. Why? If if if, if I'm in a talking about going into hell or something, I was talking about going into the woods at night. Well, a little uh, bit we more innocuous, woods, okay. don't you think? Uh, well, I I was putting another spin on it. Uh, well, I know, you know that, but, that, but it, there is no other spin. As far as I was concerned, it, that was how I was answering that question. If I don't remember specifically <sighs> talking to uh, John Lear about it, but I did often and have often said that. I would recommend going into the dark if you want to find out what the truth is, because the truth is in the dark. Okay, thank goodness. That's that has haunted me literally ever yeah. since it was said to me. It, yeah. uh, in fact, the way it was said to me was, "Art, don't go to the light. Go to the darkness. The light is a trick." I now, thought can, that. Can you understand no, why no, it bothered I can, me? I, I can I can well believe that that would be said, and it sounds like something that might occur to me to say and that I may have said, because okay. I think it might be true. Oh, and now it's bothering me again. You're on the air with Whitley Schreiber. Hello. Meg Roswell's Art, and uh, good evening, Whitley. Good evening. Yeah, I had a, a quick, or kind of a quick story here and a question. Um, every Wednesday after I drop my son off at of school, I'll, I'll take a ride up to the mountains to this restaurant on my bike. It's about a half-hour ride. And two Wednesdays ago, I drop him off at 8. It's about a 30-minute ride up to this restaurant. Um, I get there, and I sit down and order my uh, – I always get breakfast there and order my usual, and the lady says, well, we, we're not serving breakfast anymore. And I said, well, what do you mean? You guys stop serving breakfast? And she said, no, we, well, we still serve it, but we stop at, at 10.30. And I said, well, it's, it can't be like more than – you know, nine or uh, eight thirty, and I, I pull out my cell phone, and my cell phone says it's a little after eleven thirty. And I totally kind of like thinking, did I drop my son off late at school? And I was like, nah, because I remember all the cars there. It, it was eight o'clock, and uh, went outside and and uh, was kind of scratching my head, getting ready to head back down to make sure I didn't drop my son off late. And I had this this burning sensation on the back of my neck. And uh, when I got back home, I got in the mirror and looked in it, and it looked like a little burn. Now, a few weeks later, it's kind of healed, but it feels like there's like a BB or something inside there. And somewhere, it's, it appears that I've lost three hours. I ended up picking my son up at school and asking him. He's like, no, you, you dropped me off the time. I was there all day. And uh, I wonder if you heard yeah. anything about time loss and then having oh, sure. time implants. Yeah, missing time is very common. Uh, Bob Hopkins wrote a book called Missing Time about that very experience of missing time. And I had that experience, but in a very unusual context. Uh, I was in uh, France with my family, and uh, it, uh, we were 
we had rented an apartment. We were there for a few days and about a week, and uh, uh, we were. Uh, I got very sick all of a sudden in the middle of the night one night, and you know they all woke up and they decided they would go out touring. I mean, you know, because I I, I certainly didn't want to keep them from going out and uh, seeing Paris, and they went out, and no sooner had they left. 10 or 15 minutes later, there comes a knock at the door, and I'm way back in one of the bedrooms. I'm thinking, you know, why don't they just use the key instead of making me get up when I feel like this? I walk in, and I go to the door, and there's two men there, and they're nice-looking guys. I mean, uh, perfectly, and they're French. And they very politely ask to come in because they would like to talk to me about my experiences. And I think to myself, how could a couple of fans find me here? Because, you know, I'm not even in a hotel. And uh, I said, well, could you identify yourselves? And he, the, one of the men said, yes, we're, we're with the French government, and we have some interest in this. And I know they did, because I had talked to a, a f- very prominent Frenchman about 20 years before who had known a great deal about this. And uh, so I let him in. And the man says, we are able to induce the experience that you call missing time. And we would like to interview you when you're in that state. And I said, well, okay, I'm game. I was, of course, I was absolutely fascinated. I said, but I want to hear the tape of the interview if I don't remember it. Right. And the man says, well, we can certainly let you do that. But you won't remember even that but for a few minutes. And I said, well, then I want a copy of the tape. He said, no, that we can't give you. And I said, I thought about it for a second. I said, well, okay, we'll do it. And he says, would you like to listen to the tape now? And I said, well, we haven't made the tape. <laughs> Half an hour had passed. I get it, yeah. And he said to me, it's done with sound. <laughs> and I listened to the tape, and I remember now being extremely happy about what I heard. I do not remember what I said on the tape. Okay, quick question for you. On That's behalf missing of this, time. Right, missing time. On, on behalf of this last caller, he also said something uh, the back of his neck. There was something. Yeah, that back. sounds like an implant. And, yeah, it uh, does. You know, if it's bothering him and if he's still got it in there and it's irritating him, go to the doctor and say to the doctor, I've got something in my neck. Fix it. <laughs> you know? Okay, so you, you recommend that he go to a doctor. Sure. All right. I mean, Roger, uh, really, hold, hold tight. We're, we're really burning time here, so stay right where you are, and we'll be right back. This is Dark Matter, 855-REAL-UFO. Whitley, uh, welcome back. We, uh, satellite radio is wonderful. We have, I don't know if you've noticed, but... By comparison, we have all this time to actually talk about what matters. It's yeah, great. it's very cool. <laughs> you sound much more relaxed, too. Well, I am. Yeah, relaxed, yeah, I am. thoughtful. It's very good. It's a really, and I must tell you, I've really been enjoying the show tremendously. Uh, it is. So I, have, I so enjoyed your first show with Dick, and uh, I enjoyed your show with, with Stephen Greer, and the other shows have, have all been, been very enjoyable. So. Well, as I said, you can just sort of relax and uh, get into the content and almost get lost just yeah. get lost in it. You're on the air with Whitley Schieber. Hi. Eric, uh, I just wanted to tell you Mega Roswells, and I wanted to, to uh, tell Whitley that I've enjoyed his books. I've read almost all of them, and I find them to be riveting and so informative. And the work that he's done has helped everybody by letting them know what's going on. And I was unaware that things had kind of gone downhill, but I pray that they are getting better. Well, they, they are. I mean, they, you know, there's always ups and downs in this life, and thank you I very remember, much. I, I remember the low point, as you well know. Uh, with, mm. uh, people think you've just had a, a sweet, easy ride. No way. Yeah, that's No right. way. <laughs> a lot of things we can't talk about here. Hi, you're on the air with Whitley Schreiber. Hello? Yes. Uh, yes. Hello? Hello. Yes. How you doing? Fine. Hey, great. Hey, listen, I, I, um, I, I'm, I was listening to you the other day and you were telling me that you're from, 
uh, well, you spent some time in Alaska. And I did. It, 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 man, great. Because I saw this movie, <laughs> The Fourth Kind, and that really kind of, it was a really disturbing movie, but it made me kind of believe a lot. Well, well, it's a work of fiction, The Fourth Kind. It's, a, it's called a faux documentary. In other words, it's a false documentary. There, it didn't really happen. Oh, okay. That, that, that's what I wanted to know. Thanks. But it could have happened. I mean, he's, he was, uh, oh, Tundi was, we, Anna, I spent some time with him talking about this whole experience just in general, the director. And, you know, he, he, it's credible in the sense that, uh, it's something that certainly could have happened. Oh, okay. Yeah, because this it didn't happen to. I'm sorry. You know, it's getting, it's getting a little confusing these days. Uh, mm -hmm. We're mixing what we call reality TV uh, in with actual documentaries and pseudo documentaries and what's real and what's not real. Yeah, right. It's getting a little hard to discern. It is uh, getting, and I, I, I would have, I, I wasn't too in favor of it, of, of what he, the way he went about it. But you know, it's I guess uh, when uh, what was it uh, Blair Witch Project and then Paranormal Activity came out. Oh yeah. Everyone wants to make movies that feel like the real thing, but actually are fiction, and or they wanted to. That's the, now the fad is passed, so perhaps you won't see so much of that anymore. Maybe that's a good what, thing. What is there anything? Uh, and we've got very little time, but uh, you know, I want to ask if there's anything you wanted to get in tonight that you didn't, or anything you want to add, or websites you want to plug, or books. Yeah, plug I want to plug my my website, unknowncountry.com. It's among the coolest websites in the world. Uh, it has filled with all kinds of marvelously well done stories about all manner of edge subjects, and it's very credible. It was created by Ann Strieber, and she and Carrie Beeson are now the two news people. Uh, I'm on it a lot. My radio program, Dreamland, is on it. Uh, your radio program, originally, and no, yours now. <laughs> yeah, and well, I, I I thought it was a wonderful program, and I loved it. I loved what you guys did, and we still use the same theme song, theme music that Ramona picked so many years ago. Oh, now, yeah. uh, this weekend we have. Peter Lavenda, who is a fascinating man, an adventurer. Uh, he's just back from uh, the Far East, at bringing with him some of the most remarkable and unexpected stories about Adolf Hitler that you will ever hear. Yeah, I've heard about this man. I've heard about him, and uh, I, I guess he's got a whale of a bunch of stories to tell. Well, he's written. He's a. He's incredibly brilliant and well educated. Uh, in the things like the, he has deep knowledge of the occult and not as a participant. He's not, he's not a pro occult person at all. He wrote a book called Sinister, a series of four books called Sinister Forces that are about the occult influence on America, the American government and the Nazi, uh, um, Nazi U.S. government connection, which is, runs very, very deep. Uh, and which I was exposed to as a child, and you'll find that story in the Communion Enigma book, Solving the Communion Enigma. The last thing I would want to say is this. I am a writer. Read my books. Read, <laughs> read Solving the Communion Enigma. Read The Alien Hunter. You cannot but be better for having done so, and they are really good reads. All right. Well, Whitley, I want to thank you uh, for being here tonight. Obviously, of course, we'll have you back again sometime. Um, it's been a real pleasure, and you oh, yeah. really, really opened up. So what can I say? Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Good night. Good night. There you have it. That's really sweet. Quite a story, huh? Absolutely amazing. That'll do it for this night and Dark Matter. Thank you all very much, and see you tomorrow night. <laughs>